Straw Hut Media. I'm Frank DiCaro, and this is Jim Colucci. And if we've learned one thing over the years, it's Don't, don't Be, be alone, alone with Jay Cogan. Cogan. Don't Be Alone with Jay Cogan. Hi there, and welcome to Don't Be Alone with Jay Cogan. I am your host, Jay Cogan. And when I say don't be alone, I mean not don't be alone with me, but don't be alone. Share time with me. Share experience with me. You can email me directly at dbawjk at gmail.com and we can have a conversation there. I've been helping people solving their problems at home, individually, one by one, helping everyone get better, helping the world get better. That's what I do. It does, does it take all my time? Yes. Do I do thousands and thousands of emails and letters all the time? Yes. But I do it because I care about the world and I care about you, my my listeners. So uh, enjoy Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan and please subscribe. You have to subscribe on YouTube. Sure, subscribe on the thing you're listening to, whatever that might be, Amazon, Apple. But then go to YouTube and subscribe there because uh, that's where the money is, baby. The jing. And I'm all about the jing. Today, I have uh, two old friends on, Jim Colucci and Frank DeCaro. And there are both journalists. Frank's kind of a performer. He, he downplays it, but he's a, definitely a performer. And they are really smart, funny guys who have devoted themselves kind of to pop culture. They spend a lot of time in their books and their articles about TV shows and performers, performers and uh, movies and uh, just observing pop culture. And so my question today to them is going to be about well, sharing stories about celebrity encounters that we've had, because there's going to be a little gossipy in that way. But it's also going to be about the value of pop culture. And what does it mean to be sort of a hair's breadth away from pop culture? What, is it, what does a brush with greatness really mean? Uh, so we'll be talking about that and talking about other things. We'll be right back with my guests, Frank DeCaro and Jim Colucci, right after this. Don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Jim Colucci is a guy I've known for many, many years. He was he and Bonnie Dad used to be writing partners. Yes. Maybe you're still already. I have no idea. We're not, but okay. still very I asked you not but to mention his no, ex-wife. Okay. She is no, I'm lovely. Kidding. She's one of my best I friends. I know. Teasing. Wonderful. And and I don't know exactly how we met, but I we, do. Okay, how? I was gonna say, can you believe it was nineteen ninety five? Nineteen ninety five. And there was this crazy writing class called the Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. Uh -huh. And the guy who ran it had connections and so he was able to rope i mean he literally would like grab people on the right. line and say come teach my class right. and so i think he roped you in okay and so, so we met and it was great for as an so aspiring writer mentor. There was, you are my, oh, my mentor okay. of yours i'm not even kidding you're okay like, fantastic like seriously okay. you are like all, all kidding right. aside but that being the case that this class was great because we the the seven or eight people who had paid to take mm -hmm. this class got access to all these showrunners because right. this guy knew people it was great and as your mentor did i hit on you at any kind i just want to publicly say i felt very uh did you feel safe very unsafe. Or unsafe? Unsafe. Unsafe. Very unsafe unsafe yeah okay i like to keep my kids on edge you do you yeah. do you kept me guessing yeah. for a exactly. good long time for i'd say 29 years and, i still don't know your intentions and frank we met through jim yes and uh and you guys have been together for many years how many 28. 28 one fewer than i've known jay Cogan. okay and and uh and frank so you were there first jay was so there now first. we've mentioned your previous husband and yes. your previous wife yes right. all right thank you My and is coming back you know you were a talk show host in a and, and, on Sirius and, XM, on XM. For, what was I, 12 years on Sirius, yeah, right. and The Daily Show, with and without Jon Stewart, right. for six and a half years. Right, and you're a performer. And performer, but, and, a, and a vaguely, but and I str underlined vaguely, mm -hmm. respected journalist. Okay. I do write for right. magazines and, okay, but, and newspapers. But that's, yes. he's more of the journalist, would you say? Or no. you're equal? No, no. equal. I mean, he was in it first, and uh, really, equal, I got into it because equal. of no. him. No! Just going to go higher? Do you I think of you as an on-camera personality. I, think I of wish. Him, and I think of him I more wish. as a journalist. So Thank I got you. it all wrong. No, we, he, lately we flip flopped. Jim okay. does a lot of the on camera well, I see stuff him on CNN and doing I know. that. So, yeah, you there's... know why I don't do it? No one asks. Yeah, okay. So, uh, but me other too. than that, yeah, I was on the TV. No, I, I help create TV shows. I know on the that were featured on that special. Not a single ask for me to be on for any of them. And anyway. I invented homosexuality. Do they call me for these uh, gay no. specials? Never, never, not even once Never. Anymore. I know. Like, well, I, you know, I don't think you're as gay as you should be. 
to be on those specials. Uh, this used to be very gay. No. And now, Tame. Yeah, I'm, it's a, true. Oh, I'm the old, uh, I'm gay the has man. Passed you by. Yeah. I went from a big lady to now I'm the man. I know. So, so how I did guess, that happen? I, I, these kids. Okay. You know, yeah, kids, these kids. Yeah. Then they're prep. They take yeah. the prep. <laughs> they do take the prep. And they screw everything right. that's not nailed thems. down. And they're, they're thems, thems. And they take and they, they will take your pronoun and shove it up your nose. Right. No, anyway. No, I, I, I have to say, <laughs> gays are like Doritos. Take all right. you want, we'll make more. You sure. know, I mean, they just, it's, they just, there's more and more With of them. The, uh, so anyway. this show, yes. Don't Be Alone with Jake Hogan, is about me uh, talking to smart, interesting people like you about my own issues. Okay. Good. And that's what it's about. And so this issue that I brought you guys in for is about what I should do with my lifetime brushes with celebrity. You guys have both and you especially you know you 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 haunt tv shows and you try you know, you you research great classic tv but also you you know like you've had a lifetime of wandering through the world and famous people and meeting people and is this collection of memories worth anything I don't know. I wonder that all the time. And you must have a hell of a collection from all the shows you worked well, we're on. Gonna, we're going we're gonna to banter back and forth yes. about who, who has well, better memories. What's interesting is I wonder what stories are better. My stories are usually random encounters and then or a setup interview talking when they know I'm going to be writing a book about their show and maybe they're on their good behavior. Right. You see them on a day to day basis on a set. Where they're not necessarily but on I didn't good when behavior. I was a kid. Yeah, when but the, now and yeah. so when they're not necessarily on good behavior. And so the stories can be better that way. I guess my my uh like I've had a growing up in Los Angeles and having a, a father and kind of mother in show business, I've met with a lot of people and brought you know, like been in the room with, but not really you know, when you're little, they, they ignore you. But been in a room with lots of famous and, people. And I know they were family friends. I remember when we first met, I wrote a Fraser spec and you were kind enough to read it. And I had a joke in there, just a throwaway joke about annoying celebrities. And I said, Stephen Eady. Right. And you were, they're like family to yes, you. And of course, I love them. I meant right, that me as too. a loving tribute. I, but, but it's no, like, but, I know you have this but family as background. But as a comedy guy, it's like, they're fair game. Yeah, like, there's yeah, no yeah. way. I wouldn't, oh, no, I you wouldn't, weren't I wouldn't be joke. protective of them You weren't at all, but I just... I, when I realized that, I was like, oh, I hope he wasn't offended. Yeah, but no, it's, no. I meant it as loving. I grew, but I, I grew up in a house where realize. every single thing was fair game. Yes, and yeah. what's in our cabinet? Oh, home? yeah. So when before Steve passed away, yes. after Edie passed away, they were moving out of Malibu, apparently. Steve right. was moving somewhere else. And so they did an estate sale. And often estate sales mm -hmm. are when the celebrities are all right. gone. But Steve was still with us. He was downsizing. Yeah. He was downsizing. And to so the I, grave. No, no, no. no was, that was fact, later. They sold that. that piece of property that was worth a lot of money. Right. Steve uh, had a house in Nevada, and then also had one like uh, some places here. But the, the, that beach house they were just yes, in Malibu. Yeah. And so I went to the estate sale, and there was you know the, Edie had some dresses that were like I just appreciated the label on them. I was sure. like you know I knew they were valuable. What would I do with that? But what I saw that I fell in love with were these two pairs, right? Yeah. Of Baccarat champagne flutes with their names engra okay. engraved for their anniversaries. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, that's a romantic thing to keep going. Yeah. I don't want these to end up in the wrong hands. So oh, that's great. every Valentine's Day or New Year's, we toast with Stephen Eady champagne flutes. That's fantastic. But he called me and he said, should I, they're not cheap. Should I buy these? And the, the only question that's important was, are the names Stephen Eady on them? And yes, is Eady spelled course. correctly? Yes, of you course. You know, that was, and so you it was like, I would want it if Eady wasn't spelled no, correctly. No, but if the Y was in there, I was like, you buy, you come home, don't come home without those back. They're horrible, to be honest. Okay, they're so in the worst taste. Stephen Eady, right. let's talk about that. Stephen yeah. Eady, I grew up, my, my dad was a writer, helped write their act, but then we became family friends and they were, were living in New York and they moved to LA and Beverly Hills. And I, we hung out. I hung out with their house. They had satyrs and we would come there and then they would have, I would sleep over their house because their, their son Michael was my age and we were friendly. And we would go to Las Vegas together as a family and they would have like the top floor of a Caesar's Palace, like, gigantic suite. And they would the have name on the marquee. And the all kids that. Yeah. would have karate lessons in the suite. And Steve would take us to the gambling floor. And we're seven years old, not not allowed to be on the gambling floor and take us and then deal blackjack to us and with real chips and, and cheat for us and get us to win. Like violating a million rules. <laughs> it didn't matter. He, that was like what Las Vegas was. It was fantastic. They didn't get up. I mean, so when you go now, are you story. disappointed when when you don't you know get given? a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I, Las Vegas is when they don't cheat for you. Las Did Vegas is not that kind of show business anymore. It's much more yeah. corporate. It's a different kind of thing. And you can actually lose. And you yeah. can lose. Yeah. And yeah. I 
I have done that many times. <laughs> but it was just like to, to be around that old show business thing, even when I was eight years old, was amazing to watch. People who didn't get up till two. Like, what is that? Then, I know, oh my God, that's, that's a us. life for us. Yeah. <laughs> that is us, yeah, practically. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So now I have this memory of Steve and Edie, who were very kind to me and sweet and like them. I don't know what to do. I don't know what that's worth. I don't know what that is. Like, it doesn't have to have a, a monetary value, but it's like, that's just life experience, strange life experience that I don't know what to do with. It's hard because these stories, there is an audience for stories about people, especially when you love them and yeah. you know something about them that other people don't know. But the other point of part of it is that I always hear people say, I'm going to write a memoir about all these stories. Yeah. And then when you really look at the publishing business and how hard it is right. to sell a memoir, and then you look at some of the actors who are trying to sell a memoir, they were maybe the number two or number three on a big hit right. show, and no publisher even cares to publish yeah. the memoir. It's like, oh, it's unfortunate there's no good repository. I have for the this. rights to Gary Berghoff's sixth and seventh book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, not great. But, no. uh, but okay. So, yeah. So, I don't know about any of that. Like, I had, I, I, I have a good story. Oh, go ahead. Yes. BB uh, King once punched me in the stomach. Okay. Did okay, you deserve BB it? King, ah, yeah, I kind of did. I kind of did deserve it. I was a I was a runner on the American Music Awards, and Dick Clark's uh, son was the producer of it, named Rack. They called him Rack Clark, which is Richard A. Clark Jr. I guess it was. But um, so he said at one point at the end of the show, there's a big party, and they were trying to get publicity, so they wanted all the celebrities to stay in the party. So I was in charge of keeping celebrities out of their dressing room, and. B.B. King was one of the guests and he was kind of ready to go and he wanted to go back to his dressing room and to retrieve his very famous guitar, Lucille. Yes. And it was my job to say, Mr. King, uh, the dressing rooms are closed. Uh, the party is going on. Dressing rooms will, uh, dressing rooms will be open in uh, an hour and just uh, hang out at the party. And then he said, no, I really want to go back and get my uh, guitar and leave. Said, I'm sorry, you, you can't. They're closed. They're, they're locked up for your own security, for everybody's security. They're locked up. He says, I want to go back there. I said, I'm sorry, Mr. King, you can't. So I'm going back to my dressing room right now. So I apologize, but you can't. And he said one more time, I am going back to my... And I stood one more time and tried to stop him. And he took his fist. He punched me in the stomach and literally lifted me off to the other side, like moved me with his fist. From one portion of the room, he to killed another. Murray Doughboy. Yeah, yes. oh my god! I guess so, but it wasn't like <laughs> it was hurting. Yeah, I know yeah. I, that's terrible. And, and uh, then he walked in and got his guitar. You so I definitely a man and Lucille. Not, I, yeah. I don't know why I was going to the wall for Rack Clark. I had no idea why I was putting my yeah, life at what in point jeopardy. Do you say, "Oh, screw it"? How much is this paying me? When you're on the floor that's gasping for say. air, that's when you say, "Yeah, gotcha. this is all right." Knock yourself out, sir. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good story, right? Yeah. Of course. It's not a memoir, though. I can't. A collection of see this is the on, the only problem with all this stuff it's like it's like uh collectibles for the tv shows yeah. we love everyone who wants it is dead right you know? i mean that's what we're getting and or will be dead by the time will be by the time it, yeah it's tough i mean i did these series of books the dead celebrity cookbooks mm -hmm. and it was because i had interns and i would say phyllis diller and they would look at me and they'd go nothing and you'd be just painter and, not yeah. a cook yeah painter yeah, but it was just every name I mentioned. The interns knew nothing about my what father. Goes through a book for Phyllis Diller. Which one I have at home? Which ha yeah, household in? It'll be it. well, the one that says has a thank big thank you to Arnie Cogan. Everything should have a big thank <laughs> the, you. Everything they don't funny all. should have a thank did, you to Arnie. Cogan. My she next book is going to have a big thank you to Arnie Cogan. Okay, yeah, there you go. Talk so to him for What's that. your next book? The Love Boat. Okay. Yes. That my dad did a couple episodes. Yes, exactly. Of Love Boat. Yeah. We spoke for it. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks to you. Oh my. It was not a hard connection. I, I can get you. To find I can get you to Arnie Kogan. Yeah. I I do think. I mean, when you go out with Jim Colucci anywhere, yes. he is like the human IMDb. Yes. So he recognizes everybody. We were in Ralph's at the height of the pandemic. People, masks, ski hats, right. the whole thing going on. There was this much of Billy Gardell and he goes, oh my God, we love Bob Hart's Abishola. In and, the, in and the, like the new okay. thin Billy Gardell? No, it was the old heavy Billy Gardell. Okay. So come on, the, just by the shape alone. Okay, get that. all right. Still, it was this, it was a stri it was a eyes of Billy, it was the eyes of Billy Gardell, which would be like the sequel to the eyes of Laura Mars, Not but it would be the eyes of Billy Gardell. It's amazing to me because I don't really know who Billy Gardell is. Like, he's like, the, the I know guy who used to be fat. I know um, he's the Mike star. Of Mo, um, Bob loves Abba Shelley, but he was on Mike and Molly. Yeah, the, all, both shows I never watch. It's he's like, oh no, the Bob Hart's Abba Shelley is great. It's a great show. Yeah. delightful. All right, but Jim can spot them from the back of his. A woman in an elevator one time 
said nine please and right. he went oh my god doris bellack was that who it was yes it was See, doris and he was bellack. you know and it's like first of all if i don't know them then they are doris obscure. bellack you know, he knew exactly who it Tootsie, was. Tootsie, the soap opera director, the short, little short redhead. Yes. That's her. Okay. Scared the daylights out Fantastic. of her. Okay. The woman almost had a stroke. I, she because... did not. She loved it. In fact, there have been quite a few times where I've recognized people and they've been so happy they've done their line. Their yep. famous line for me, the woman, Helen Hanft, who was in How, I think it's How I Learned to Drive, and she does that line, you failed, the Lord giveth and the DNV taketh away. And she nice. looks up. She did that line for me on Sixth Avenue. Yep. And there was a time in San Francisco. Oh, this story. Yeah, the, this is just to embarrass Frank. We go to the Tonga Room in the Fairmont Hotel. Okay. It's in the middle of the day on a weekday. We right. was, this was 1998, I can tell you. I'm I was a there. long I was time there for tiki a, lover. I was yeah, there sure. for a business conference. I, Frank's with me. We go to the Tonga Room, and there's only one other occupied table, and they seat us right next to them. And I recognize instantly that it's a woman and like three or four guys. And the woman is Lisa Dar, who had just finished playing Ellen's girlfriend on this, uh, the coming out season of Ellen. Okay. But I had seen her in a 1991 in a very short lived sitcom called Flesh and Blood that I loved. Mm -hmm. and Can so I just interject? I was jealous because I was up for Ellen's girlfriend uh, on the show. <laughs> yeah, and you and didn't, didn't make it? Too femme. Okay. Didn't, have, too didn't femme. have a white suit. I, I yes. was too girly. Right. Too girly. So I see Lisa Dar and I say to Frank, I want to say something to her. And he's like, leave her alone. This is her vacation. Right. You're always bothering people like Sylvia Miles, another story. Oh. And leave her alone. And I was like, fine. But I did what I always do. He always has to pee. Right. At some point he's going to get up. Right. And when he's gone, and he's you're gone, free. I'm free. Yeah. So I wait for him to go to the bathroom. It wasn't her, a long wait. I yeah. turned to her, Lisa Dar and I sa said to her, I loved you on Ellen. I loved mm -hmm. you in Flesh and Blood. She got so excited. She got up, gave me she a said, big hug. She said, I knew someone she would. She said, I knew someone would recognize me on this trip to San Francisco. And all these queens, she was sitting with all her friends, right. said, no one gives a shit about you. And right. we had a bet. And so you just won oh, me the fantastic. bet. And I'm so happy. And she said, wait, we're going to do this again when he comes back. Because right. I told her I wasn't allowed. And so Frank comes back. We're sitting. All of a sudden, I fake it. Are you Lisa Dar? <laughs> she gets up. It's bigger than before. Oh, a fantastic. bigger hug. Yeah. She does the whole story and then she punches him and says, and that's for saying you shouldn't have said anything. Ah, that's beautiful. So you can thank that meeting on his prostate. I can. Yeah, I that's guess. fantastic. Yes. Great. That was thank you. back when he was young. Sure. Can you imagine how many people I can think now? I know. Even my prostate was young. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Who's the biggest celebrity? Like the top tier, topest tier, like Cary Grant, John Wayne, a like decent encounter or a crazy encounter? Doesn't matter. Crazy Just... would be Meryl Streep. I scared the hell out of her on okay. the subway. All right. Long story short, well, it's gonna end. It ends up being long because there's a lot of fun details. Thanks to you, I had met Carrie Fisher. Okay. And so Carrie Fisher was doing a book signing at the Barnes and Noble at Lincoln Square. Mm -hmm. This was, I can tell you, it was whenever they were making the Devil Wears Prada. It turns right. out, but I didn't know that. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go to that book signing. Frank wanted to go. Bonnie, whom we mentioned, wanted to go. We were all going to take the subway, the same one nine train from different stops, end up at, Union, at Lincoln uh, Square Center. He tells stories in real time. I want okay. You to know. So the, it's only an hour show. <laughs> the the train stops at at 42nd Street. I'm sitting there. This woman walks on the train. Beautiful woman, really well dressed. It's late summer, but she's dressed autumnal, like this big rust colored scarf and flowing. With, and I thought, oh, to myself, oh, beautiful older woman. Blah, blah, blah. And I looked down and I thought to myself, kind of on the order of Meryl Streep. <gasps> that is Meryl Streep. <laughs> and so she walks on the train mm -hmm. and she sits down at that one. I'm I'm at the thing where the, it's like this, with the, the gap here. She sits on the other side of the gap. So she's like this. Right. So, of course, not willing to let her have a moment's peace. I decide I'm going to get up mm -hmm. and just stare at her like a creep. So she's sitting like this and she puts her head down and her eyes closed, I guess, is her way of not making eye Right. Contact. I'm invisible. I'm invisible. Mm -hmm. So I stand over her holding the same pole like this. Right. Totally creeping, creeping her, her out. Yeah, yeah. Creep, totally creeping her out. So that, as if that's not bad enough. So we're advancing up the west side. And as I start to think, she must be going to Carrie Fisher's book signing, too, because she knows right. postcards from the edge. Sure. She played Carrie's character. But she knows her. I'm, oh, this is great. She, we're going to walk into this book signing together. Me and my best new best friend, right. Meryl, that I'm not creeping out at all. Sure. As so we you get, have no self-awareness at all. No. Yeah, not you at don't this know moment. who you are. Okay. No, it comes, but too late. So as we approach the stop at Lincoln Center, I start to get concerned, though, because Meryl has her eyes closed and I don't know if she's even listening to the muffled right. announcements. And I figured I better let her know 
that we're getting to this right. book signing. She's but how did you do it? Mr. Train. But I don't want to do what I did to JFK Jr. on the subway, mm -hmm. which was totally out him and embarrass him right. in front of everyone. JFK Jr. I kind of right. have okay. a great day, Mr. Kennedy. And he right. was like, oh, right. thank you. Right. So, and I would be the one who would say, God, I want to make soup out of your volleyball shorts, you know? <laughs> so I'm even right. worse. No, sure. I, like, I just yeah, wished him he, a nice day, but he had been yeah. trying to hide behind a newspaper sure. and I outed him. So I'm not going to do that to Meryl. Right. I'm going to do something more clever. Sure. So I'm going to speak to her in a way that only she and I will understand. Right. You know, when you think that, that you're already on right. the train. Right, problem, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a problem. Just, so I decided- This is a stranger, remember. Yeah, strange. well, uh, in to my mind, to we're us. already best friends. We're right. walking into the sure. book signing. We're, we, I think we have champagne in our hands. Right, we're, yeah. okay. <laughs> so I lean in, uh, again, another mm -hmm. great decision, lean into her ear and whisper to her, and I think I'm going to address her as her character from Postcards from the Edge. Because uh, everyone, that, that, right? everyone does that, Because everyone does that. This so, is so painful. It's painful, I know. Right. So I lean in and I whisper in <laughs> her ear, come on, Suzanne, this is our stop. Ugh. And But it was, come on, Suzanne, yeah, this is our it stop. Was right. it was, you know it what was the kids call this, Jim? Whisper. Cringe. Yeah, yeah. No, this wow, is cringe, that's this it. is cringe. Okay, wow. keep going. So that's why I said, do you want a good story? Or you want no, no, story? that's good, this is good. So, with that, she opens her eye and looks up like at that. I mean, I, that's where I realize it all comes crashing in on me. I'm like, oh my God, you made this all up. She, you don't know that she's right. going to this book. You, you don't know she's going to this book. You, may, oh my, you just watched the frequency Kenneth Meryl Streep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. So I turn bright red, and with that, the doors open on the platform at Lincoln Center, and I jump out of the train. And you would think for devilment this happened because this so seldom happens on the New York subway. The train just sits there. Ugh. And no one else gets off, and there's no one else on the platform at Lincoln Center. I'm like, how is this like statistically possible? Right. So I did the best thing I could think of. I wanted to know if she's getting off the train. Right. So I went and hid behind a pillar because that's not ah, also creepy. Jesus. This so I'm is hiding so behind a pillar, staring like into the train, and the train is just sitting there for an eternity. And just as you hear the ding dong, like the train is going to start to leave, Meryl gets up very cool and collected and exits the train right. on Lincoln, the platform in Lincoln Center. She's I'm like, waiting for you to leave. She's waiting for me to leave, but it's like the train waits for her. She's magic. Right. Like when she was good sure. and ready, the train would leave. So she sees me hiding behind the pillar. Of course. <laughs> and comes up to me. Because you're hiding like this. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I'm fat. I'm not, it's no, a skinny no, pillar. Like leaning out. It's a skinny then, pillar. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of me and right. yeah, a yeah. lot of giggling. All right. And so she comes up to me and says, I'm sorry, what did you say? Right. Now this is my opportunity to correct everything. To correct and say, I'm everything. I'm sorry. I thought you might be going to the same uh, book signing that I was because, of, uh, but but I, I didn't mean to uh, overstep. That would have been Plan A. Yeah. I went with Plan B. Right. Which was say the same thing because if you try to first, I thought maybe I should say something that rhymes with the same thing right. so I could gaslight her into thinking I did something sure. sane. But I couldn't think of what would rhyme with. Come on, Suzanne. This is our right. stop on the spot. So I just said it sheepishly. So I said, I repeated, come on, Suzanne, this is our stop. And she's like, oh, uh-huh. And then she waited to see which direction right, I went because there's the more way. than one exit. And then she went the other way. Right. So now I exit and I run I run up to the into the Barnes and Noble and actually they've even blocked off the escalator to the top floor because it's already filled. And I just pushed past the Barnes and Noble employees and ran up the escalator and I ran up to Frank and I'm red and I'm like practically crying. And I'm like, I just said something crazy, Meryl right. Streep. So as I'm trying to get the words out and he can't, she comes sauntering up the escalator. Right. And she brushes right by me and gives me a look and then goes, and so she was there to see Karen right. Fisher. So However, you, so I did every, not make quite the impression I intended. So you, so your plan was exactly right. Yeah, Everything so the way you did it was I'm vindicated perfect. completely. Okay, I'm vindicated fantastic. completely. So that is my, yes. Okay, that's what the, celebrity have you scared? Uh, who have I scared? Oh God, I don't know. But I can tell you who my biggest was. Yeah, who's your biggest? I had lunch with Andy Warhol. Oh, wow. I was in Detroit writing for the Detroit Free Press and they said he was coming to town for this book, America, book of his photographs. And uh, he was doing a signing at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And so they said, we've arranged for you to have lunch with him afterwards. I wish I knew who the entourage he was with because it was like, we drove out to the suburbs of Detroit to this restaurant and uh, there were like 10 or 12 of us at the table. I have no idea who the other people were. And I bet now I would have known some of them. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, so I'm all excited. I got this big story I'm gonna do for the free press. And, uh, and I said to him, I said, uh, Mr. Warhol, you have managed to stay on the forefront of the art avant-garde for decades now. How have you managed to do that? And he said, I don't know. And I asked something else, and it was another two-word answer. Right. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm dying. Right. And I thought, what am I going to do, you know? Right. 
And I thought, oh, what the hell? And I said, is it true that Paul Morrissey and Lou Reed have AIDS? Because that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, where would you think of that? <laughs> and suddenly we started to gossip. Right. And it became uh, New York, and we gossiped for an hour. Fantastic. And it was really great. And of course, there is not a photograph of me with Warhol We've because I've tried in, as like as a present for him. I went, I called the Detroit Free Press mm -hmm. and said, can you go through your photo archives? Right. Does it exist? But in those days, journalists didn't do that. You were supposed to be respectable. So you never asked for, you never played the fan ever. Right. You had to sort of act like I'm not that impressed, even though I'm dying because right. it's Andy Warhol. Um, yeah. But I, but so and that worked. And a year ago, a menu from that day that he signed was up on eBay. And it was so funny because it was like dated and, right. and I was like, oh my God, that's the from the lunch I was at. Fantastic. So, and I didn't, it was already had sold. Oh. But um, but it, I have my memories of, of being there. But it but that was that was sort of the biggie. Why do we crave to be in their company or be near them or find out about them? Like, what is it like about the golden you wrote about the golden girls? You love that show, but you got to know intimately all the people who made it instead of just like, oh, I like the golden girls and that's enough. You dug deep. Well, that's just human nature. If yeah. you love someone, you want more. And yeah. You want to know more about them. You want. You also want your special piece of them that may be unique. Yeah. So I, I mean, that's why, as much as I embarrass myself with Meryl Streep, nobody else did that to her. Right. She she may have other crazy that's, stories of fans, right. but no one else did that. that. That's still running the streets free. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think, in some way, I mean, I think cynically. People would say, "Oh, you're a star effer, and you want." No, but it's no. It's I was going to say, and you and you want to bask, it, like it's that it's self-aggrandizing. That you know that to be in their company, you're raising yourself up. Well, and in no some ways, that. that's a little bit true. But I also think I just am so appreciative of talent, and it's like they're the black tar heroine of right. talent. So when you you know, I mean, the idea that. I've had dinner with Dolly. I've had lunch with Andy Warhol and right. dinner with Dolly Parton. Mm -hmm. That's a big you know, And sat, I mean, just the two of us. Right. You know, and um, for an interview. And it's, you know, I've eaten foie gras off Dolly Parton's plate is kind of amazing <laughs> thing well, no, to have gotten to do. And when it turns out they're not only human, but they have weird quirks. Right. That's even better. Then it's a real right. present. Well, but I mean, yeah, but I think that, I think that, that for me, a friend for Jim too, I do think we really love talented people yeah. so our appreciation is very genuine but the star you know our my my, uh, my worth goes up when i'm standing next to a star that because fame is fleeting that's not worth a whole lot you can talk to somebody who's 20 and say you know what i hung out with charles nelson riley and uh, i have stephen eagle edie glasses and they're going to stare at you like well the first mistake is talking to someone who's 20. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they don't nobody cares nobody cares about sylvia miles and any of those these names d to a certain extent and dolly parton yes any Warhol, probably, but I mean, it's like that all fades away. It all makes well, nothing so anyway. It's so ephemeral. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It's just, well, uh, that's why you have to do it for your own enjoyment because everything does fade. I mean, we'll get when, to it fast. Yes. And then tell everybody quickly. And tell everybody quickly. Yeah. No, but I, when you read surveys that people under age 50 have no idea, zero recognition of the name Montgomery Clift, or sure. you talk to that people. That was the one that always killed me. You talk zero. to people in their 30s and 40s and they don't know who Elizabeth Taylor is necessarily. That's I mean, right. it's. It's both inspiring and depressing. It's depressing, of course. Right. But to me, that's almost inspiring because it also takes off the pressure to make any kind of mark and have any kind of ego about anything. Yeah. Because n no one other than the very, very top of any are going to be remembered for anything. So don't try to do it to make your mark and be next to the person and think you're going to be famous by association. Just do it because you like it. Right. Well, there's a whole psychology about, you know, all of this, all this fame, all this trying to be famous and or social media fame and all is 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 fighting the inevitability of death that you're trying to have some sort of way to extend your life to make you know yourself or your world go beyond your lifespan and it's the subconscious desire to not die but think about how generous it is to the people you're telling the stories about who have died because then their life has is going beyond their lifespan. They say that you're never truly dead until the last person stops talking about you. Well, right. we just talked about Stephen Eady. Right. We just talked all these people. It's the last time gone. somebody was talking about Stephen Eady or Sylvia Miles. So no, no, it no, may it's not, not be. Sylvia, maybe. No. But I, I can want to hear about the time I scared the shit out of Bruce Springsteen. Yes, please. Okay, so <gasps> I did too. Okay. Oh, wait yeah, a minute. We did okay, on the that... bathroom line, on a line for the No, toilet. that was different. All right. Well, you. Uh, no, no. Ours ours just you go first. Yours is better. All right. So. I, we, I was working on The Simpsons and we were trying to get 
Bruce Springsteen to do a bit on the show where uh, there's a, the baby falls or Bart falls down a well and there was like a tribute song for Bart to fall down. The baby down. Jessica song. Yes, yeah. exactly. The yeah. baby Jessica. Uh, so we were going to yeah. have a tribute song and we tried to get Bruce to be the guy singing the song. And we called his manager and his manager said, we can't get a hold of Bruce. We can't get a hold of him. But but I, I think he might be interested. Said, well, recording date's coming up. We really got to know. And then at some point I'm at a movie theater that doesn't exist anymore in Century City. It was the ABC Entertainment Center at that time. And there was a Century Plaza movie theater. And I was in there and Bruce Springsteen was in there with Patty. And I see them and somebody goes like, Bruce Springsteen. And so I, I run up. I'm not a small guy. I'm a big guy. I run up to Bruce Springsteen and I say, Bruce! Like, I'm his, A, I'm his buddy and B, I'm not an imposing monster coming towards him. I, does he, he have security? Because I mean, he I, does not. Was, he did wow, not have security. But he stepped, he stepped in front of his wife, uh, Patty. I think they were married at the time, uh, and and to protect her from me. And I saw that when I saw that move, I went, "Oh, I should slow down." And then I, 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 I like an idiot, I said, I, "It's not what you think." Uh, I work on a show called The Simpsons, uh, and I was wearing a Simpsons crew jacket. Now, at the time, everyone was wearing everything that had Simpsons on it. There's no special marking that says crew jacket. It just looks like I'm wearing a Simpsons coat. And I said, and I said, we want you to be on The Simpsons. I'm a producer of The Simpsons. I'm a producer. And he went, uh-huh. Yeah, sure you are. It's like, and we want you to sing a song. And we've been trying to get a hold of you. And we haven't been able to get a hold of you. Oh, well, that's great. And I point to the patch. It says, as a Bart patch. I said, See, I'm a producer. And he said, uh, would you be interested in doing this? We kind of have to know. It's like, oh, yeah, I definitely want to do this and I'll, I'll I'll talk to my manager right away. Of course, he never talked to anybody. He just thought I was a crazy fucking lunatic who scared the shit out of him and his wife. And then later on, we got Sting to do it. Okay, well, A, that's a good ending. Yeah. But B, I mean, wow, you even come with the real credentials of of The Simpsons and still can come off crazy. Like, that makes me feel like my approaches are really nuts because I don't even have that. I'm just coming up like, hey. Oh, good. I'm glad you didn't feel I better just thought from I that story. I, okay, worse. Good. I thought I was in contact with his manager. He may have heard about right. this, no, this thing. Right, no, you had a legit reason. But no, I, but I, but I approached him in the exact wrong way. Yeah, well. And he scared, I obviously scared him. What was your scary? When business? I had hair. Yes. Okay, this is important. <laughs> okay. So when I had hair and was living in Detroit. Yes. And it just fell out shortly thereafter. I had a- Because you were living in Detroit? No. Okay. It, it's a, cars it, had cars. Fans. This yeah. was a long time it ago. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Anyway, I wore a pompadour. Uh -huh. yeah. No. Anyway, so- Did it was you have a Coney dog? Did you have Coney dog? Yeah, I did. Okay. All right. That's true. So I, uh, I, was, I went to a hairdresser who was very connected. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what that means, but if you needed tickets to anything the day of- Right. You could get them for All right. So he would make one phone call and boom, you'd be there. Well, we went, he said, do you want to come to see Bruce Springsteen? And I was like, yes. So he was free with a buck and somehow we ended up like five of us in four seats in the front row of Cobo Hall or whatever yeah. arena we were at in Detroit. And uh, just, I was like six feet from Bruce Springsteen. Well, it was his, it was his born in the USA phase. And someone should have said to me, put your tongue back in your mouth. Okay, sure. <laughs> because I was drooling. Yeah. And I looked at him like, you know, when when uh, like the wolf sees something and then the it's like it becomes a chicken. Sure. Like the, you you turn can see into the, food. the yeah. chef's hat uh -huh. on the end. Of, yeah. He turned into food. I wanted to eat Bruce Springsteen. Okay. I, and I was I was, he was a very young handsome gay. back then. He was very fit and yes. I was a young gay and I don't think he was used to a, a boy in the front row. Were you hoping for a little Courtney Cox like, moment? I you was I, on stage even, and... even if we're just uh, I uh, dancing Bruce in the dark. Springsteen That wasn't the enough, word I was going to use. But Bruce yeah, Springsteen we were probably got more else. adoration from young men than he did from young women. He did I don't I don't know if that's true. At that I do point. think that's true. But he was very hot. The reason why he did the Born in USA look and fit was to try and elicit more women into the group because it was all young guys going, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to escape this death trap and we're born to run. I didn't want to do that. I was like, how would you, could I come and live with you? I and know. And make Nick Nick? Yes, you know, right. I wanted to make Nick Nick. Sure. So I, I just, but I looked at him like a piece of meat and, right. and, and I think I scared him big time. But then we were online at the From the Sopranos. stage? I was like six feet away. I really was in the front row. I mean, it looked like... Bruce is tougher than that. I don't believe that you're scared. He looked uncomfortable. At the end of the day, 
we're done, you know, you're 95 years old, you're looking back on your life, this sort of being involved in the pop culture life, at the end of the day, would you feel like uh, that's a, a satisfying, I'm not saying that's all your life because you've written things and done things, but but it's kind of cool to look back and say that I was part of this time. Does that like- Well, this, you have this, I mean, you're actually creating shows. You have that more than I do. Yeah, you, but I mean, I, that fades away. Like people don't remember already. Many, many shows I've worked on are gone in the public memory. You so never know, but I mean, you, you and, do and have the ones The shows my father worked on also gone. It's, it doesn't really matter. But there are ones that aren't. And that's that's really the, the uh, to me, that's the dream to create something that is your art that we're, we're like a photocopy of that. We're one generation removed from that because we're talking to you about the thing you created. But I have I do have to say that people say to me sometimes about the books I've written that oh, I'm so glad you rescued that story. And especially with Love Boat, that's what I'm really finding right. because Love Boat was all these people from all different parts of the world and they had crazy stories. And so, yeah, I, I'm happy about that. I'm happy that because some of the stories are campy and fun, but some of them actually have meaning and would have been lost. Right. And so I'm glad to have done that. What's the what's the thing that are my audience? The four I have four listeners. What's the thing <laughs> that my four listeners should buy, like of your thing that's out right now that 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 you need to uh, promote? That you've got like, come on, buy the thing. Okay, right now yeah. I have drag combing through the big wigs of show business, and it's everybody from uh you know some like it hot to to the RuPaul girls, and from you know uh, uh Milton Berle to you know, Marty Frickert mm -hmm. and and everyone uh, from when I was growing up to Flip Wilson to the girls who are, are making it happen right. now. Um, and then in December, or excuse me, in October rather, uh, and I hope people will give it in December for mm -hmm. the holidays, uh, I have a book coming out called Disco Music, Movies and Mania Under the Mirror Ball. Oh. And it was a similar sort of approach of like the kitchen sink of uh, not only here are the great artists and the great songs but here are the terrible songs and here are the here's the barnaby jones disco episode <laughs> and uh, so it's it's got all of that uh barnaby jones is a there. show that was on for 45 years and <laughs> yes. i never saw a single fucking oh episode. my god during the pandemic the we, binged, we, binged we binge reason. watched all yeah. of the 170 of them because we're a thousand years old secretly all right so now this is a, a listener mail now it's time for listener mail And so this is from uh, a listener named Patrick, and it's a very long letter. I do as a layman wonder about fame. Uh, last weekend in Vegas, I was in the company of a lot of celebrities, some I considered very famous. However, then I was in the company of super famous of a super famous person. I talked with their people, and it sounded awful. The night before, with the simply famous people, it seemed okay. People would come up and ask for a photo. I became the Ansel Adams of F1 trackside photography, and then the in, then uh, interact and leave. But the next night with the big time celebrity people were insane. The absolute disregard for this person's personal space and time amazed me. Here comes the question. Along with that, I don't want to name drop, but the star we were with had prejudged to the point that I kept telling everyone I had zero interest in talking with them. Now I'm the ass because they were lovely and literally everything I thought uh, was wrong. My question is, when famous, how much does the disregard of the non-fan affect you? Once I heard Wayne Newton say, when he's doing a show and he sees someone not into it, then it becomes a show just for that person. He has to get them into it. But what about just in life? I'm Celebrity X, people like me. Why don't you? Is that a thing? Yes! Oh my God, if you've ever done stand-up or anything, the one person with the arms crossed is the only person in the room. And that's, we all are fucked up like that it's yeah. like it's the one negative person who doesn't like what you're doing when a thousand people are thinking you're the funniest thing ever it's that one person sitting on their hands and you and ever you could be you, jerry seinfeld and you feel that way everybody right. feels that way we're needy fuck of course we're needy but it's sort of like eh, you know you know if you're doing anything there's going to be a certain amount of people who hate what you're doing if, it's just a social media post does yeah. that never mind something yeah you're gonna get an angry response for nothing for no reason let alone if you're a performer and you know if, when i did uh the simpsons had just come out and people were it was very wildly successful people went out of their way to tell me i don't watch your show and i don't i don't care for that it's like okay like fine we're not gonna, we're not gonna miss you it's they all were right cosby show loyalists no i don't they know remember they, just, they were pitted against each I other i think they didn't want but to that's staggering to me that, that it's the same on social so it's per, 
heightened on social yeah. media where it's like, yeah. I didn't like that. So shut up about it. Yeah. You know, it's like, right. If you liked it, talk about it. If you yeah, didn't like it, plenty of times I on. hate a film and I don't say anything because why would I ruin it for somebody else? In fact, right. there's one film that I alluded to recently that having hated and I deliberately didn't give too many clues about what it was because I didn't even want to ruin it for anybody. Right. And I loved it. That was the other problem. Oh, yeah. so. All right. Now it's the time for the moment of joy. Oh, boy. A moment of joy. What this is, is what gives you just joy in your life? What's a something? It doesn't have to be about fame or just through the day today. If you could do it, it would just make you happy. What is that thing where the where the sound you get off on sounds? What's a that? ASMR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. ASMR. Okay. I like the, the sound of coffee being poured into a mug every morning is the most glorious thing. And nothing it, it nothing matters until I hear that sound. And you love coffee. I, I love coffee. Okay, well, that would make so, total sense. Yes. Yeah. But that sound, I like the sound as much as I like the taste of it. What about I, the smell? I like People love too. the smell of coffee. Yeah, but it's but there and Jim thinks it's disgusting. I hate everything about I, coffee. I don't, I don't drink coffee either. Oh, no. It I hear it in the mug. Yeah. And it just it's it's just the most beautiful. It's right. just it's as good as uh, do you drink Coca Cola? Yeah. Okay. Coca-Cola. You know that? No, Jacob yeah. drinks. Like, yeah. Oh. No, but you know when you open it, it goes, yeah. Shh. Yeah. It's the same. The coffee in the mug is the same sure. kind of thing. It's like. A sensory cavalcade. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm down with that's that. That's a little, a little bit of that's joy. That's a moment of joy. I have two. Uh oh. One is we have a new, uh, relatively new, she's a year old, but we got her in October, a pug puppy, pug okay. mix puppy. Yeah. And there are moments where I'm just sitting at my desk and I'm either. And your moment of joy is when the pug actually is able to breathe? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. When she's alive, when right. I can see she's alive. When she jumps in my lap on my desk chair right. and like, I'm like, oh, I'm doing my work and I've got this amazing oh, creature. Yes. The other one. And so you can't have that one because you said it's one that you can have. Here's one I have that a you dog. can have. Oh, yeah. But you can't have my, yeah, my yeah. you can't have my yeah, penny. Right. She, I'm not letting her. No, I he let me name her too. Yes. Yeah. But you know, she's mine. Right. Mine. But uh, the second one you can't have. And this is, I didn't appreciate it in its time. And now I appreciate it. When I, I did write a book with Norman Lear mm-hmm. and I got to talk to him often, of course. And I also got to observe him doing other interviews and mm-hmm. stuff. And a lot of times people would say, what was the best part of your career? It was always a, what's your best, what's your favorite mm-hmm. kind of question, which is natural for somebody who's had a long career. And at the time I didn't appreciate the answer he would often give because I thought it was a little bit of a cop out. It was a way to avoid picking a favorite. My next thing. Well, he often said that yeah. my next thing, but what he also would say is, you know, if you'd say, what was your favorite moment of your career? He'd say, being with you right now. Right. And yeah, that sounds like he's just patronizing or, or avoiding the question. But actually, no, because he meant it's the culmination of everything I've done right. getting to this moment. It and was, I appreciate that now. He was in this moment, right. enjoying this moment, and being patronizing, which yes. is the perfect and, oh, really combination. Good, yes. right. yeah. Exactly. But there is a there is an element of knowing how to enjoy the moment and enjoy how, what everything that brought you here. And now that he's gone, I, I, I yeah. uh, appreciate that. Moment. I was very happy to be able to tell Norman Lear when he turned 100, I said, no more fucking awards for you. You're done. <laughs> That's it. We've celebrated you Enough. plenty. Enough. It's fine. We're and done. I, I was going to say, and and meeting someone who's very smart and funny and being in their company is always a thrill. Yes. That's but right. Smart. I mean, they're boring and smart. It's but, not so also, good. but but smart. Somebody, I did a, an interview one time and they said, the lightning round kind of thing, smart or funny? And I said, smart. And they stopped the interview. They're like, not funny? And I said, they said, "Why well, was assu- they said, well, I was assume people who are funny are smart." And I said, "No, that's not true." I said, "There yeah. are people who are funny who are dumb yeah. as homemade soap." I but, think people but, who are truly you know. funny are smart, though. They can't be truly funny without being smart. I wish I agreed with you. No, you, don't <laughs> have to, you don't have to agree with me. I agree with you, but it depends on what kind of funny. Witty, witty, funny, or or fast. Anything. On your if you if you if you're in your brain, you figured out how to make someone else laugh. You've you've done, made that calculation, and you because do you it. came up with that. Yeah. But there are people who are funny as actors because they're given the lines. Oh yeah, I'm not talking about that. I'm about talking that. about people who create their own material. Yes, and, I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I just think some people are just funny because of the way they talk or the or whatever. Those people that yeah. are huge, the unintentionally have, funny. They have like huge. My parents. Yeah. No, I was thinking there are any. I could not naming names, but there are any number of people that just they show up and they talk nonsense, and everyone thinks they're hilarious. And I'm just sort of like sit there going, Yeah, but that's not funny. Teeth. But you're not laughing. I'm not laughing. So but the world not, is, and so, they're working so a lot. So they're not so funny, and therefore not they're not me. smart. So they're dumb as a yeah. box of rocks. There's a but, lot of people who yeah. claim to be comedians who are not funny, and they're not smart. 
I'm going to quote, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but I'm going to quote a line I remember Andy Kindler saying one time at the Montreal Comedy Festival because he'd always give this state of the <laughs> state of the fest address, which was the highlight yep. of, the, of the festival. And at one point, he said he said to the audience, he made an offer. He said, "I will give anyone here ten thousand dollars if you can produce a clip." of Whoopi Goldberg actually being funny. <laughs> <laughs> I do like, and I have to say, I don't think people should be mean in public. Yeah. But I think in private, when you take the gloves off and the two and, and your partner in, in crime says things that are beyond mean right makes me really happy yeah. like if it's right. really yeah, we bonded in evil. really yeah. evil that's okay. It really makes me happy. That's, that's all right. And then I always tell whenever or if he corrects someone's spelling Oh, no, the line. And I said, do you use spell check? And he said, no. And I said, why? And he said, I don't have to. And I said to him, I said to him, you're just trying to get in my pants. Now you stop that. <laughs> I was going to tell you, when we texted you, we were going to be late. And you right. wrote back, all right, as two words. It, it moved a little. And what did I, yeah. I, and what did I say? I said, you liked it because yeah. he spelled all yes. right. right. That really made me happy. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. We did. We both. Huh? That's what we talk about. Talk no. about most like most gay guys. We do look. We do get a little thrill out of all if right. You're counting on my spelling words. and grammar to make you guys happy. You're in bad shape. Oh. Because stick with my dog. Not, I it's not going to work the, out. Better keep a, the hot, dog. Uh, a hot grammatically correct text is like all right as two words is yeah. just that's boom. sexting sex right. and for us it is it really on that is. hot sexy note. I would like to thank you both for being here. Thank you, Jay. Jim. Frank, is it? Frank, it okay, is. Yeah. And you're, I was going to say, you're one of those funny, smart people I'm happy to know. I've, but I'm taking it back. Hey, you I already got the gig. You don't have to no, flatter it's, it's over. You're here. You're you got over. it. Yeah. Kind of, it hasn't gone out yet. Yeah, I don't know. This could end up in the trash. That's true. We're one delete back. button. Ryan, Boom, let's bury done. this one. Uh, anyway, I'd like to thank you. For, thank you, our four listeners, for thank being you, here. Listeners. Please uh, write to me at uh, DB. A W J K. That's don't be alone with Jake Kogan. That's what it stands for. D B A W J K at gmail.com. And you don't be alone. Do go talk to somebody for God's sakes. Don't sit here and listen to podcasts. What's wrong with you? Do something <laughs> with your life. All right. Until next time. Goodbye. Don't be alone.